So Andrea, thank you very much for joining us on Africa Uncensored. Thank you for having me. Um, the first question, of course, is what is the biggest concern for Human Rights Watch on the, on the African continent right now? Which area do you think is not being covered or doesn't get enough attention? Human Rights Watch has the reputation traditionally of often covering the stories that aren't being covered yeah. by other media or other organizations. At the moment, I think there's two different examples of work on Africa that Human Rights Watch is very close to. Mm -hmm. In one case, we recently had our researcher who covers the Democratic Republic of Congo was yes. ejected, essentially. We've covered DRC for many, many years, um, and that has been a great concern. It's not the first time we've had a researcher basically barred from a country, but in that particular case, it came about rather suddenly and in the middle of quite a bit of work that was going on on different issues. The good news is in that particular case, we've trained many local staff. So we have a research network on the ground there still, but it's something that is a country that has always been very close to Human Rights Watch's research and have even been cases we've taken to the International Criminal Court, yeah. which is my second point. Yeah. Um, I'm sure many of your viewers have seen in the newspaper, certainly here in Kenya, I think this has come up before. There have been a series of countries that have either withdrawn or threatened to withdraw from the International Criminal Court. And Human Rights Watch played a role in the establishment of the court with the Rome Statute back in 1998. So that has been a big concern, particularly because many of the justice organizations who work around the court in Kenya, in other countries in Africa, have been allies of ours for many years. What is this, this uh, sort of um, stepping back from the international justice system, from, from your point of view, where do you think it's coming from? Because it, it looks like a lot of the countries on the African continent are doing so, but if, if Russia and perhaps other countries that would be allied to it are considering it as well, then there has to be another motivation. We've seen this pendulum swing back towards a sort of isolationist, monopole yeah. kind of role for certain countries. And I would be curious what your viewers think about that in Africa, because I'm not quite sure how that plays out in a continent where I think there are multiple players who are quite powerful, but key players in situations like this. Well, essentially, on the consensus among quite a number of African mm. leaders is that you know, African justice, African solutions for African problems, and that the, uh, the International Criminal Court and some of its partners, including the Human Rights Watch, are looked upon as this force, you know, this Western force that is trying to force its own opinions and its own um, definition of justice on the African continent. So in, in some respects, that, that's also happening. But I'd say that I'd, I'd really be interested in your view on what exactly this means for work around human rights. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this swing to the right as you as, as you described it, and perhaps also this this move away from the International Criminal Court, specifically on the anti African continent. What does that mean for human rights work here? I think there's something to me that's definitely worth acknowledging that mm -hmm. there are Western paradigms. Yeah that do exist and prevail in certain settings. I, I think that's worth acknowledging and I believe that too. Yeah. I think what concerns me when we get into what I would refer to as relativist arguments about, maybe to take your wording, African solutions for African problems, African justice. I don't know if I disagree with that per se, mm -hmm. but I would like to scratch the surface of that and get underneath it because I think that can become in many cases, not just the African context, a slippery slope. Yeah. Like we have one set of rights for certain communities and other set of rights for other cultures, and we start to get into this debate that moves away from the idea of equality. For me, that's one of the fundamental questions. I think the other thing that's very important in terms of how we're actually doing the work, and the criminal court and other sort of bodies have crystallized this in some way, there is a role that the media is playing in all mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. and how the media in each of our countries and more broadly, globally, because a lot of the media is owned by the same corporate entities, how are they portraying? From what I've seen so far in the papers here, and I don't want to yeah. claim to have too much expertise, there's definitely a certain viewpoint. Um, I don't want to explain the Kenyan media to Kenyans. I don't yeah. need to do that. But there's definitely a clear voice that does seem to be in opposition to the criminal court and the cases pending against certain individuals. However, what I've been told and what I've observed since coming here is that social media is quite powerful in Kenya, uh, particularly Twitter. So even though mainstream media is definitely 
in my mind, following a certain set of key messages. It does seem that there's a very vibrant discourse online that is probably not in line with that messaging. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't have like a true analysis for you, but it definitely seems like the media I've seen is anti yeah. international criminal court and universal jurisdiction, not pro. Um, there have been reports almost every year on the human rights situation in Kenya, for instance, from extrajudicial killings to to um, the use of the military uh, improperly in different parts of, of, uh, of Kenya. What do you think is the biggest human rights situation that Kenya is facing right now from the point of view of Human Rights Watch? Good question. I think, once again, I have two things that come immediately to yeah. mind, and you said one of them. Um, since I've been here, it, extrajudicial killings comes up in almost every conversation I have with different activists and people, even in the media and the yeah. film world. Um, that term has different meanings, I think, to different people. It's not so black and white um, as it might appear at first glance. Human Rights Watch did do a report just a couple months ago about it. We do the research in such a way that it's as irrefutable as possible. Mm -hmm. People will always deny and reject, but we have to come with a set of facts and data that for the most part is indisputable yeah. or verified by other sources. So engaging with the government does require a lot of that credibility work. Then the other level to it is, of course, collaborating with other NGOs, local and otherwise, who are doing the same work and telling the story perhaps in a slightly different way, more anecdotally, with testimony from survivors and victims, which we do too. But I think the impact that we're having has been greatly enhanced by the collaboration with other groups on the ground who are yeah. concerned about it, and perhaps by taking a more nuanced view, that it does have gray areas. The military has refuted some of the claims that were made in, in uh, the reports that accuse them mm -hmm. of playing certain roles. And uh, saying quite plainly that you have no understanding of the context, you don't have an understanding of how the security apparatus operates in, in this country, then how is it that you can, you know, you, you can uh, deign to talk about critique. the military or critique the military in, in such a very direct way? I mean, how do you go about collecting your evidence? I think there's a few different answers because Human Rights Watch's methodology has evolved over the years and, and is considered quite rigorous in that, for example, if we take a testimony from someone in a particular, let's say, neighborhood or village, depending on the context, our policy is that testimony has to then be reaffirmed or corroborated by at least two other people in terms of name, date, what exactly happened, the basics. So we have this sort of threshold for corroboration of individual cases when we do victim testimony. With regards to military's critique, I think most of us in Human Rights Watch take on board those kind of critiques because unless you've worked in the military or unless you've worked in the government, there are certain things I think we would agree you don't necessarily know. Yeah. However, there is a greater response to that in that we do our work under the rubric of international law. So whatever the dynamics are within the framework of the military or the yeah. hierarchy, there are certain international standards that govern things like arbitrary arrest and detention and extrajudicial killings. So we're operating from the point of view of taking the evidence or the case studies and holding it up against the standard. Yeah. This relativist, you don't understand because you're not a policeman or you're not in the military. I, I acknowledge that, but it doesn't necessarily break the chain of the story as framed by international law or even national law. In the long term, the Human Rights Watch's presentation of evidence, will, of course, will provide institutional memory for the kind of things that are happening now. Mm -hmm. But do you think that because there doesn't seem to be any impact that it's getting worse, and by the time that people acknowledge what's happening now, will be so far gone that there's really m m very little that we can fix? And there are definitely things where from what I understand, if society is not on the same page, I I'm not sure everyone agrees at the moment that every ju extrajudicial killing is wrong. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a fair point. So I don't know if I could effectively argue that Human Rights Watch can take on a collective moral compass of that magnitude mm -hmm. and redirect it. Um, in society, if society is making distinctions around <coughs> that, yeah. we have to acknowledge that to some degree and be realistic um, about how to do the work. I think a situation like South Sudan or some of the other countries you mentioned in the Horn of Africa are more extreme when you're talking about armed conflict. I think that tends to be less of a gray area for most people. Not always, not always. But it does kind of bring back these ideas of interventionist forces. But even the AU has stepped in, you know, in certain cases. So it's not exclusively Western intervention in those yeah. cases. Where do you get your funding and how do you ensure that 
that it, that you you're able to establish that independence between you say you and the country where you're headquartered mm -hmm. how do you establish that independence where do you get your funding um, human rights watch only accepts money from individuals and foundations mm -hmm. and as I'm not the first to say it. all money has a color, yeah. um, but we do not accept any government money, not money from the European Union, United Nations, none of those bodies. So the only money we accept is from individuals and foundations, and even that is highly vetted. Mm -hmm. Like there's a very specific process for how we determine who we can accept money from. Um, the world swinging towards the right, extremism ri rising in capitals uh, in in the West. Um, political extremism, you can, you can describe it as that, and there's just outright extremist thought and action in different parts of the world, including Africa. What gets people to the place yeah. that they are so afraid or angry or disenfranchised or disillusioned? And so, you know, we just had a conversation the other night here in Nairobi about extremism, mostly talking about radicalism within the religious context, but the, what you find the driving factors are, and I'm sure you could speak to this as well as I can, poverty lack of quality education, marginalization for different reasons due to ethnic or religious background. Do you think that this, this swing to the right, where people have legitimate reasons, even the United States, yes. being excluded here, of course, being marginalized and being forced into, uh, into these kinds of groups, do you think that that's a failure or, or some sort of audit of the international, of the global economic system, and that perhaps at a more fundamental level, that actually should be a human rights issue and we need to start addressing that. Human Rights Watch has worked on, for many years, various economic, social and cultural rights. The right to education, the right to health, uh, the right to water. So for us, we're operating quite specifically under the human rights documents, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, etc. Yeah. But when you break those down into operational categories, I think we are looking at globalization through the lens of these rights that we see being broken down quite mm -hmm. clearly. Um, there's a whole host of labor rights, you know, that are in the back of my mind as well that we've worked with.